Welcome to this conversation on excellence, aesthetics, and value. This picks up from previous conversations on artists and identity. Now we're moving over into how art gets into the world, beginning with these abstract keywords. I want to introduce the panelists, but let me say first, thank you. This is McDowell. I am uh, Madam Chairman of McDowell, Nell Painter, and uh, this is also the 92nd Street Y. Uh, our artist this evening is Joyce Kozloff, beginning in 1970, energized by participation in the feminist art movement, Joyce Kozloff beca became an originating feature of the pattern and decoration movement, exploring applied and decorative arts, especially visual cultures of the non-Western world as source and inspiration. During the 1980s, Joyce Kozloff concentrated on ambitious public commissions in the US and abroad, many in transportation centers, executed in ceramic tile and or glass and marble mosaic. By the 1990s, maps had become the foundation for her private work, structures into which she would insert the role of cartography in human knowledge and as a, an imposition of imperial will. Her map and global works, which image both physical and mental terrain, employ mutations to raise geopolitical issues. Recently, she com completed two large-scale public artworks at the 82nd Street and Central Park West subway station, MTA Arts in Transit Program 2018, and the new federal courthouse in Greenville, South Carolina, GSA Art in Architecture Program, to be opened this summer in 2021. Her new work, American History, perfect, at her gallery, DC Moore in Chelsea, will be up June 24th to August 13th. The series is timely, as the paintings are based on maps of Civil War battles overlaid with viral outbreaks. <laughs> Linda Harrison is the head of the Newark Museum of Art, which is New Jersey's largest art museum. It's a large complex urban museum campus and Linda Harrison plays a strategic and unifying role for the organization and the city. She communicates the work and the mission of the organization. Linda works with the board staff and community to identify and implement priorities and tactics to further their museum's goals. Linda's vision incorporated five critical paths to be worked on simultaneously, as if you didn't have enough to do, improving financial stability, investing in digital future, developing right infrastructure, levering and enhancing the brand, and investing in right programming. During the first year of her three-year plan, Linda established a new senior leadership team and revamped the organization for more engaging and community impact. And we'll come back to that. In 2020, an extensive D DEAI racial and gender equity framework was developed and implemented throughout the museum. Linda currently serves on the following boards of trustees, the Association of Art Museum Directors, the American Alliance of Museums, uh, Regional P Planning Association, Art Pride New Jersey, Newark Alliance Collaborative and Rutgers University Newark Advisory Group. I should add that before coming to Newark, uh, Linda was the head of the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco. Garth Greenan is an art historian, art dealer, and the owner of Garth Greenan Gallery in New York City. Primarily through his work as his New York Gallery Greenan represents and recontextualizes the work of a multi generational group of established artists who deserve greater recognition, which is one of our themes today. His gallery currently represents 27 such artists working in a variety of media, 
including painting, sculpture, drawing, and printmaking. For decades, Garth Greenan has questioned the prevailing narrative of contemporary art history, drawing attention to its blind spots and encouraging his revision, which is just what we're talking about today. So welcome to all of you, and thank you so much for being here. So we have three big words to start with, excellence, aesthetics, and value. Uh, so I have a question to start with uh, to Joyce as the originator, the artist uh, in our discussion. Um, what does excellence mean to you? But before I ask you to say something, let, let me frame this by saying that for McDowell, you know, we are one of the premier artist residencies. Um, you could call it a heritage art residency. And there's only one criterion for fellowships, and that is excellence. So for you, Joyce, as an artist, what does excellence mean? Well, I, we're probably all going to agree that it's totally subjective and um, always changing. And I was trying to wrap my brain around this, knowing that that was going to be the first question. I started thinking about those charts you get when you have to evaluate a product or a doctor, excellent, good, fair, poor. Uh -huh. And um, so excellence is something we're all supposed to be uh, aspiring to. Um, but it, it, in my lifetime, and I'm 78, you know, I've, I've seen this just all explode and change. And, and, and I'm grateful for it. Um, there was something about, you know, when I was young, there was this kind of Greenbergian aesthetic and the word quality was thrown around yes. a lot. Yeah. And, and in, in, in a way it was a very authoritarian way of judging art very patriarchal and uh, narrow, narrow in, in, in so many ways. Um, and now we're seeing at Gars Gallery and other galleries, artists my age who have always been around, who have recently been discovered, but they were always there. And the art community knew about them and the artist community knew about them. Yeah. Um, and and so many of them were so deserving all along and are only now being called excellent, but they were always excellent. Yeah. Um, if we must use that word, I don't think I use it very often. Um, it's, it's so problematic. <laughs> well, we still have it at McDowell. It's still the single criterion. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to work on that. So when you have your juries, this must be a subject of conversation every time, I would think. I would think so. I have never served on one of those juries, oh. but they, they change over time so that it's not one of those juries where uh, people are built in and year after year after year. In the olden days, it was like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the last generation, it has changed remarkably, but we still, since last year, uh, need to revisit the question of excellence because we want to keep some criteria. But it's You're art is not a science, that. that's the problem. Yeah, so, so Linda, um, I'm gonna skip ahead here for a moment. Um, let me find, okay, so, um, the Newark Museum of Art is a nonprofit, so you don't have to think in terms of profit. And I'm going to come to Garth in a second because he's not a nonprofit. And while we're talking about these issues of excellence and aesthetics and value, when we talk about value, we have to talk about materially, material value. But Linda, you have to deal with money, of course, but um, according to the museum's mission statement, you stress your audience over your collection. You say, we welcome everyone with inclusive experiences that spark curiosity and foster community. Um, and I wanna throw a monkey wrench into this also 
because you have recently been subject to a controversy about what is, well, valuable actually for your museum. You recently deaccessioned some works, but let's go back and let me ask you about how excellence plays into your thinking as you run the biggest art museum in New Jersey. Well, um, Nell, th thanks for having me and, and, and joining uh, both of these uh, two great people on, on either side of me. I, um, I really want to um, uh, tag on to uh, Joyce saying excellence is, yes. is really uh, subjective. Um, and what we find in the museum world is that um, particularly um, when um, I'm running a museum that's 112 years old, that made some progressive moves um, yes. back a hundred years ago. However, when we take a closer look, um, that subjectivity may have been just through the lens of one um, uh, element or the majority may have been um, through a white male lens. Mm -hmm. And so what we are trying to do um, is actually have more voices in um, uh, open that lens, open that um, window so that um, you weren't aware that there was someone named Richard Mayhew that was still uh, doing these wonderful um, um, abstract uh, paintings, but he wasn't in the view. And, and so excellence could have been um, uh, uh, something different uh, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and, the, and uh, even as, as we, we move um, uh, in, into our contemporary works. And so, we we want that excellence, but we want that excellence representative of of different um, points of view, mm -hmm. different stories, and and we think that adds uh, to this. Um, and, and so we're we're trying to really look at um, what is a, a good representative of a particular uh, of um, uh, even category of art as we are looking at our uh, history is to uh, collect art of the Asian, the African, um, and the American diasporas, and then our decorative arts. And so we particularly make a point of not collecting um, art from European artists from Europe, because um, at that time, um, when the founder developed uh, this museum, it's like, wait a minute, there, we need to have this museum be a museum for the people and of the people. Yeah. And, and pretty much, though it's 112 years later and I am their, um, uh, uh, only their eighth director and their first black um, director, it's like, it's, it's back to that same piece that um, for the people, a museum for the people and, and, and what does that mean? And sometimes you, you, we need to adjust maybe what was in um, our collections. We spent a lot of time um, when I came in uh, to revamp our mission because our mission had the collections first. The collections are important, but um, not more important than the people who will experience, will interact, will look at this. And I believe just from a historical standpoint, a lot of fine arts museums, this has been the driving force. It's always about the collection. Um, uh, and sometimes uh, at the um, sacrifice of the people internally as well as externally, uh -huh. that we have to look at this holistically now. And this is why we made a shift uh, in our mission because we wanted to really tell the people, particularly in Newark, we sit um, in downtown, this campus is four and a half acres and um, we are in this, uh, majority black and brown um, city mm -hmm. and uh, and other people of color. This is doesn't mean that we're canceling um, that foundation, but we have to expand the stories. That's what then um, uh, the brouhaha that uh, came up. Um, 
this is uh, deaccession is an everyday occurrence at um, its standard operating uh, procedure business uh, to look at your collections and look at what's redundant, what could um, uh, what what uh, is in need of care that we can't quite or no longer to take care of it. What um, what are the storage issues behind um, uh, uh, our deaccession? So we look at our entire collections. By the way. We have 130,000 fine art objects wow. <laughs> that we have to take care of. And, and when you move to the 21st century and you have acquired um, that many art objects over time, the storage does become an issue. And because we just don't put things in a closet, right. we have to actually take care of this collection's care. So there was a... Um, intersection uh, in this last um, 18 months, uh, last year, of prior to the um, AAMD, um, that's our uh, Museum Association of uh, mm -hmm. um, Museum Directors, prior to that, deaccessions, we're doing it all the time, and that monies is only used to acquire art. Yes. Nothing else. So because of the pandemic, and the association said, what is it that we can do because museums across the country are truly um, hurting? This was to be a tool. And that tool would be for a finite period of time, two years, that you could use the accession funds for collections care. And this is something that a lot of my uh, colleagues, we have to also balance taking care of the collections. Um, there was uh, um, some excitement. I, I will share with you that there are, there are two sides of this. There are those of my colleagues who believe you will only, you should only use the accessions money to acquire new art. Then there are those that are in the camp that I am in, and I can almost tell you it's, it's almost a 50-50. Um, that, because um, there's been a lot of debate about this, that um, we could have this two-year um, opportunity, it's a tool, and that it will be thoughtfully used by the directors because there is this operating part of our budget that we need to also look at. It is not to use it as a uh, cash machine. And then I will tell you, there are people that think if the, once you sell something, you're going to sell it all um, for the sake of uh, uh, just cash where you should um, uh, fundraise. So we still fundraise, but um, I know the, 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 <laughs> you, you, you still know that. But the 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 um, the debate is like, well, why did you um, sell this particular piece? Because this particular piece tells this story. We happen to have went through a very, very rigorous pro uh, process with everything that we deaccession, yes. and there was a, a piece, um, and not only that piece, there were a few other pieces that people feel, oh, why are you doing this? Well, we need to make room for the stories of women, the stories of people of various colors, and we could do this because we had depth in um, a particular uh, collection, our Hudson Valley uh, uh, collection. Um, the, the same was with um, uh, one of the O'Keeffe's. We have several uh, O'Keeffe's that can tell this story. We even some sculptures, um, 17 pieces, by the way. Wow. That were uh, in this category under this umbrella. There's still more. We do this. Um, uh, this this is a, when I say it rigorous, it is rigorous, not just myself, my deputy director of curatorial, but also the trustees, the acquisitions committee. We, we just don't do this in uh, a vacuum. Looking at this thoughtful approach uh, to deaccession, I know that's a, a, a little bit of a long um, uh, story um, around this, but we, uh, I think it ties back to excellence and, um, uh, what we want the museum to, the museum should be the steward of excellence in various voices, not just in one area. That's our work that we're doing now uh, to, to make this transformation. And one might call it an interruption in our 18th and 19th century galleries, because we must do that to be able to tell um, 
uh, expanded stories. Yeah, well, you touched on on two um, phrases that we could probably talk about all day, and one is storage, and one is insurance. <laughs> uh, well, museums could certainly talk about that. Well, I'm I'm sure Garth could probably too. talk about that Artists as well. Too. Artist now, shouldn't. Joyce, for instance, makes some really big pieces, and Joyce has to deal with storage and insurance. Um, I don't think, well, I don't know, I won't ask Joyce if she's a profit-making entity. Let me, let me turn that over to Garth. Um, so, so Garth, you have, in your statement, talked about changing ideas. I don't know if you used the word excellence, but it's the concept is there and the concept of what is the beautiful and changing tastes, the words, the, the meanings that are within the word aesthetics. And then the question of value. Now, um, those of us who make art know that we are the makers, but we can't get our art out without you in the first place and Linda in the second place. So you have carved out a specific place in the New York art world and in the art world in general that was part of your statement uh, about um, revisiting uh, modernist artists, artists who have been making work a long time. Would you say something about your concept of value um, I mean, you are a dealer, so value right. is really material. So say some words about value, will you? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, I, I began my career as a gallerist um, kind of because I was, I began my career as a gallerist sort of curious about how um, value was established in the art world and sort of fascinated by it because uh, at the end of the day, I worked for a um, kind of a, a really um, weird kind of embarrassing secondary market gallery before I ended up with my own space. Mm -hmm. But um, I just saw a lot of stuff that I didn't ever want to do. Um, and, I, and I, oh, just the secondary market sales and just the way that people would buy things that in my mind had like no value. They would buy, this was a secondary market gallery that like sold. Wait, 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 wait Garth. Not everybody in our audience is going to understand what you mean by secondary market. Would you explain? So these are things, objects that don't come directly from artists or artists' estates. These are things that, um, you know, have been sold, you know, who knows how many times, you know, and they, they've changed hands, you know, maybe a dozen times. But I, I just, um, one of my first jobs in the art world was selling like things that in my mind, you know, it was interesting that they existed, but it would be something like, you know, de Kooning did so many drawings and some are birthday cards, some are Christmas cards, some are, you know, notes to his dentist, um, you know, and it was, it, it was amazing to me what people would pay for them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and this was, this was, a, it was a summer job. Um, and I was very good at selling stuff, but this wasn't the stuff that I wanted to sell. And I had this kind of list in my head of, cause I'm an obsessive researcher, this list in my head of artists that were interesting to me whose work was not being quote unquote valued. And, you know, in school studying art history, we never talked about the academy is here and then the world of commerce is here, you know, and academicians, they really don't want to talk about commerce. People in museums don't have a problem with it in my, in my experience, you know, because museums have to acquire things and they have things like budgets and all the things that Linda was just talking about. And artists don't have problems talking about it either. I think artists are sometimes mystified by what we do as dealers. Um, but anyway, as far as value is concerned, it was amazing how devalued a lot of the artists that were most interesting to me and whose work I recognize as being uh, of the highest kind of aesthetic value, or at least the most interesting, um, it was amazing how devalued those artists were and how, you know, I, I remember discovering things in the 2000s like Artnet where you could, you know, this was one of the first tools you could use to look up auction comps. And so you could see, you know, what things had sold for um, back about, you know, maybe into the 90s, late 90s by 
um, artists that were interesting to, 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 to you. Um, and, uh, for some people, I mean, for some people that I that are now that I now have very big careers, it was really shocking what the things were trading for. And, um, you know, I don't really care about any of this stuff, but it was interesting to me because it was just a story about how artists careers are made and how little aesthetic value can can often come into play when I think before this moment, before let's say the last 10 years, mm -hmm. um, how little aesthetics actually came into play when it came to establishing, like putting a price tag on something. Because wait, Howard, wait, wait. It's, Howard, it's a little bit more about that. Well, there were major works by Howardina, for instance, mm -hmm. Mary Heilman, Linda Benglis, um, you know, Elizabeth Murray, all artists, maybe not Elizabeth as much, just because she's always had major representation. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I know that Howardina and Mary, um, you know, uh, let's see, who else can I think of? Oh, uh, John Quick to see Smith. John Quick to see Smith, uh, Rosalind Drexler. I mean, these are people that I work with. I don't work with Mary Heilman, but she's a friend. And, uh, you know, the work would come up at auction and would, it either wouldn't sell or would sell for a few thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. And it was just because people have no idea what they're looking at. I mean, the auction is, you know, it's it's like, you know, the market is kind of like, it's like open outcry. It's like the floor of the stock market. And, you know, it's just one example. It's a very poor context for a specific type of artist artists, you know, which is, is a phrase that gets thrown around that I'm, I'm very interested in that type of artist. you know, artists that have, or, you know, it's not a good auction is not a good context for artists who just do what they want to do too. So who, you know, make a body of work that doesn't look anything like another body of work. But, it, you know, if you really follow the artist, you can carry the thread with them through what, you know, what they're doing. I mean, John Wesley is a very interesting artist and he's another one whose market has just bounced all over the place. And, you know, so all I can say is, is that as far as value is concerned, I have always been interested in the establishment of value and how value gets assigned. I grew up in Washington, D.C., where all the museums are free. And um, a museum that I went to very often as a kid was the Hirshhorn. Mm -hmm. And the Hirshhorn is just one person's collection and then there have been things added. But Joe Hirshhorn built the majority of that collection during the 50s and 60s. And so, and I think, think the early 70s is when he really stopped. But it's a slice, you know, you see hanging um, a lot of really great art by people that, you know, as when I first started in this business, um, which is only fairly recently, um, I'm going to be 35 this summer. Um, but uh, you'd see works by Alan D'Arcangelo. You'd see works by Morris Lewis. You'd see works by um, you know, Rosalind Drexler. There was always a big Drexler uh, hanging called Home Movies. Oh, really? um, yeah, it was in the basement. Uh, not the basement. There's a ground, there's a, a, a downstairs. So there was always a Drexler, a Rauschenberg, a Warhol, and a Rosenquist hanging in the same room. And the Drexler was the best painting. And I remember that has, and nothing, that is nothing that's, that was a completely, um, that was a completely objective opinion, or sorry, not objective, sorry. That was my subjective opinion established as a kid, you know, mm. going to see those works. And they were always on display because that part of the collection, it just was always out. And anyway, but, you know, Drexler, you couldn't find anything on her. Um, no one knew what to do with her. And, um, you know, she's objectively as important as Warhol. I mean, Donna DeSalvo did a great thing um, during this last Warhol exhibition where she acknowledged Rosalind as one of the, you know, progenitors of pop. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and she's the woman that they mentioned, you know, alongside Rosenquist, Lichtenstein, Warhol, and Oldenburg. I mean, it was in the, the wall text as you walked into the exhibition, finally. finally. But anyway, the point is, is that you could see these things in this collection. And so they were of value at a moment in time. But then the art world turned, you know, and focused on other stuff. And um, but again, that value, I, it's, it's so clearly to me, you know, had to do with. And this is where I talk about representation or representation and recontextualization. It had so much more to do with where you showed, who liked your work, um, you know, who wrote about your work, who your collector base was, and the, the overall climate of the time, or you didn't stand a chance and it didn't matter how nice or how beautiful your work was, you yeah. know? 
It didn't matter how good it was because there's so many artists where the work was objectively so much better, you know, in so many ways. Uh, and, you, and you could make those arguments, you know, and, and people agreed. I mean, there'd be a consensus among scholars that the work was like Ralph Humphrey is an example of an artist that hmm. he is a, an artist artist that I don't know a single person who doesn't love Ralph Humphrey. Every curator I know, every artist I know, everyone loves Ralph, you know. But he was hot and then he was not, you know, but his work was so much more interesting than stuff that is worth so much more money, you know, today that continues to be. And I've represented Ralph for almost 10 years now. Hmm. But yeah. um, it just, you know, I mean, he died in 1990, you know, and he had two shows with Mary Boone um, at the end of his life. He died of AIDS. And then there was a whole lot of nothing. So, again, the value was just. It, it, like value, I guess where I'm coming, where I'm, where I'm getting to, I could talk about this. I and mean, this is very interesting to me. I could talk about this all day, but value is almost like something that, you know, it's, it's nebulous like excellence, but it's something that has to be maintained. And people have such short attention spans that you almost have to shove it down their throats and you have to remind them that something is of value. Um, because I believe that art is, has an art in general has intrinsic value. So first, you, you know, that's something that you, I think that all of us accept. Art has intrinsic value, but assigning a monetary value is something that happens in galleries and then through exhibition. I mean, it just has to be, the, the art market today is so crowded, you know, and my director, who's also my best friend, every time we walk into Art Basel, Miami Beach, he says the same thing. Uh, he's a he's a uh, an artist himself and he but he's he's also a dad so he doesn't have a lot of time to make art but he always says the same thing he always sighs deeply and says there's too much art in the world and then he'll say my art is better than a lot of this yeah yeah and the answer is he's right you know i mean and, and it's so i mean howardina my relationship with howardina is similar to my relationship with jean they were both white pages calls um you know I, I literally looked them up in white pages and called them. Um, wow. And, um, you know, I mean, I mean, I, I doubt I'm the only person that saw what is plainly there, that the work is of, of significance. And it was shown alongside, you know, other quote unquote, good artists. But, you know, you'd be hard pressed to convince me and, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's just interesting. It, it's the story of why we talk about certain people at different times has so little to do with the actual thing that we're looking at. And it's, mm. it's making me smile because I mean, it's like you'd never, you, you could never convince me that, that Rosalind Drexler is, um, you know, uh, is, is, is in any way less interesting than, um, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a big James Rosenquist fan, so you're never going to think that Drexler isn't a big, isn't yeah. more interesting than James Rosenquist, yeah. or isn't more prescient. You know what I mean in terms of what she was doing with the what politically in her work and yes. the the gender dynamics at play, and also the style of appropriation that she was, you know, those those kind of appropriation uh, 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 techniques that she was she was using that were later co-opted by or not co-opted, but explored by the pictures generation mm -hmm. you, you'd never you could never convince me that uh that that robert mangold is a more interesting abstract mm. painter than howardina pendel but bob mangold you know had better representation or he, he had representation available to him howardina didn't you know mm. I, I think the art what i what i'm not I, trying to make enemies here i'm not trying to to, I don't to think talk, you're, you're, to talk you're badly about enemies. other artists, but it's just yeah. sort of like, or or Linda Banglas, who has always had great representation. Linda is arguably one of the most important American sculptors of the last hundred years. You know, why hasn't she had 10 retrospectives? Mm. You know what I mean? But, but Linda, you know, had the one at the new museum and she, you know, it, it's, I feel, I still feel like with people, it's an uphill climb. You know, they'd rather buy a John, you know, why did John, you know, John Chamberlain had so much more attention paid. I think Linda changed the conversation around making sculpture a lot more. Certainly in terms of materials. Uh, yeah. And appearance. Yeah, definitely. Well, I, I'd like to, Linda, go ahead. 
I, I, I actually um, think that this um, notion of value, this is where uh, the museums also play um, a role here because um, we get to choose who comes into the museum. And we know that the moment we um, uh, stage an exhibition for um, an artist that is actually going to um, assist them and, and whether or not even we acquire. And, and this, is, this is a piece that though we don't assign value, we're not making a decision on value. And we, we just did this with uh, a piece of work. We have a decorative arts collection. We have a, a, a fabulous quilt collection in our decorative arts. We, we have a lot in our decorative decorative arts, but I'm, I'm using this quilting as an example. And then we have um, a, a few pieces of works by um, Faith Ringel. We decided that we would commission a um, work uh, by um, the artist Bisa Butler. Sure. Bisa is, is on her rise. It, 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 it's like, oh, would someone do that? Well, as the museum, we didn't do it for the value of what the Bisa Butler piece uh, is financially. We commissioned this piece. First of all, this is um, um, an African-American woman um, who is doing yet another version in, in her uh, approach to um, uh, social justice through her quilting. Well, we we see what Faith has done. And we said, we, we are doing this to expand our collection in this area, to make it stronger. As a result, we know that um, this is, uh, you know, what we call the museum bump, whether we talk about it or not, this allows um, uh, some of the artists uh, to then, oh, you know what, then maybe we should um, uh, show this piece. I mean, and, and in her case, um, Art Institute of Chicago said, oh, we want the commission piece that you're going to show that's going to um, really add to uh, the show. She's She's now, you know, she's doing work at that. She'll have a show at the Smithsonian. I think she'll be in London talking to them about a show. But this is, this is how the currency of the um, museum, that value, as we say, it doesn't really start from what something costs, it's how, how, can, how can we explore expanding that collection? And, and I have been um, uh, that director, uh, even with the uh, smaller um, cultural museum, the Museum of the African Diaspora, where um, we're showing uh, particular works um, and all of a sudden uh, collectors at a show and they decide, oh, we're going to uh, buy, we, we were not aware of this artist. Um, so I, I think part of it is not only those uh, artists that are um, on the rise and are making it that have not had that exposure um, in a museum and then being part of our collection, but I think it's also um, a commitment that I believe as a, a museum director, um, uh, us having emerging artists and having a formal process for emerging artists to also uh, be shown at the at the museum because it, it it's not just showing it it's also wrapping that artist uh, emerging artist um, with uh, uh, the umbrella of how do you how do you talk to a gallerist how do you prepare your uh, body of work to even be presented to a museum because we. We, we know that when you're in that category, um, sometimes it's just how you might present that really allows you to start moving forward and be paid uh, for your practice. Um, mm -hmm. And, and the, this, this is, a, a, I think, a new world for the museums as well in terms of ah. accountability. Sure. Um, I'd like to say something. Please. In, uh, historically, um, when I was a graduate student in New York in the 60s, Rosalind Drexler was highly visible. And um, what has happened historically to women artists and certainly artists of color um, is that sometimes they're celebrated in their lifetime and then they disappear from history. And I did a certain amount of research as many people were doing in the 70s uh, on the quote unquote old mistresses Angelica Kaufman was famous worldwide during her lifetime. Artemisia Gentileschi 
was well known and celebrated during her lifetime. But by the time we got to the 20th century, they'd been written out of art history. It took the feminist art historians to mm -hmm. resuscitate them and bring them back into our consciousness. And I remember, I sometimes tell this story in the early 70s, Miriam Shapiro and Elaine Lester Cohen invited a few of us together and said, let's form a consortium and buy the work of the Russian constructivist women. They had no market. Goncharova, Popova, Stepanova, no one heard of them, no one was buying them, and we didn't do it. We didn't do, we didn't have money. We didn't have, money. We didn't have, we were young artists. We didn't have the consciousness of collecting. Uh, Miriam and Elaine were 20 years older than the rest of us. They were an older generation and they had some experience. Uh, Elaine was a collector of uh, constructivist artists, what, as well as being a painter herself. Um, but you know, it's something that I regret, and not because of the money, but because of the the uh, power that you give to these women by bringing them back into the world. Um, so that's yeah, Joyce. While I have you, um, I want to ask you. When I was in art school, um, uh, pattern and decoration was sort of trivialized as sort of a woman's thing, uh, which. Um, as far as I know, that's how you began and that's how you, you made the first of your reputation. Now you make uh, big pieces, you make sculpture, you make public art, and you make maps. Have you seen your own profile change as you change your aesthetics in the sense of as you change your materials and your, your scale? Um. Well, I think there's several questions inside that question. Um, I still consider myself a decorative artist. I mean, whatever I do, that decorative sensibility is there, and I'm I'm uh, I'm proud of it. I'm not. Uh, I, I think you know it was very maligned. The worst thing you could mm -hmm. say about work was that it was decorative when I went right. to school. And uh, for all I know, that attitude may still exist in some places. It does. But um, we reclaimed it and we weren't only women, about half, half of the group was men and half the group was women. Mm -hmm. um, so the group that met and talked about these things and we came to it through different routes. I did come to it through feminism, but then I discovered that others came to it through growing up in other parts of the world or through being in the counterculture or uh, a kind of just not, uh, feeling comfortable with the with the kind of formalist uh, aesthetic that dominated at that time, so um, I don't even remember the other parts of your question. Um, I I've always been a decorative artist. I'm still a decorative artist, but I'm also a, a restless artist, and um, so I I'm, I admire those artists who have something they finesse for their whole lives. But I I kind of get a different idea. I want to work in different materials. Mm -hmm. I want to work in different scales. I get different ideas I'd like to try and and work on. And um, I, and that is not a generalization about artists. That's just about me. So um, there 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 is a a, a notion that. Um, uh, the decorative arts are, are, are the territory of women, but that is not altogether true. And, and, and in fact, what we're seeing now is a, a revival of interest in ceramics and textiles mm -hmm. in the art world, yeah. which, uh, which, you know, I couldn't be happier about because we talked about breaking down the high art, uh, decorative art hierarchies. And now that's, that's happening. And that, of course, brings more people into the conversation because the decorative arts were associated with women and and, and non-Western art and 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 for us it was all art. You know, it was all <laughs> wonderful if it was wonderful and great to look at. Yeah. yeah, Garth, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to say, just in terms of also value, you know, the idea of getting, you know, having getting, how do you approach a gallery and getting your work out there? I mean, it has changed, you know, I mean, yeah. curricula have changed in schools where they actually talk to you about how you approach galleries, which, you know, is not something that happened for a very long time. But what I, what I was going to say is that, 
you know, I mean, I represent a lot of contemporary artists who happen to be indigenous, you know, and this is a large group of people who, um, you know, are still, you know, I mean, there is no such thing as redness, you know, I mean, we can talk about blackness, we can talk about whiteness, but there are so many, there are thousands of tribes, you know, um, you know, uh, they don't necessarily have anything in common. And, but it's, it's a very diverse group of people who, you know, have essentially, especially on the East Coast, base, uh, you know, basically they've essentially been erased just because we've yeah. occupied this part of the country the longest. And wow. so we've done the kind of thoroughest job of, uh, you know, uh, making them invisible. But I just know from talking to Howardina, who is, you know, a black woman, um, that, you know, she didn't feel comfortable approaching galleries. Like, you, you know, if you read somebody's stable, you know, if you go into a gallery and you see who they're showing, okay, you get the vibe. And if the vibe is they only show men, there's your first barrier. Well, I'm a woman. Oh, they only show white men. Oh, well, okay, that, that strike two, right. you know? And so what are you gonna do, you know? And so getting your work out there in order to be valued is very, very, it's, it's just even more challenging. And also, it's so much easier to look at work now than it was a long time ago where you had to give someone your slides or get them to come to your studio. I mean, I don't look at submissions. So when, you know, we don't accept unsolicited submissions just because it's, it, again, it's also very easy to send people your work. But I was going to say, so if you think about that for an artist that happens to be female, if you think about that for an artist that happens to be female and Black, or you think about that for an artist who happens to be Indigenous, it's like, where do you even start? You know, if you've been making, you could be making the best work that anyone has ever seen, but you remain invisible, you know, until you're able to show it. And if the climate is such that you don't think anyone's gonna, gonna care, then it just stays in your studio, you know? And I think that that was the case for a very long time. You know, Rosalind always talks about, you know, women not being, oh, I can't cross my legs this way. I just got a tattoo. <laughs> um, Rosalind talks about women not being bankable, you know, but I think, you know, and she thinks that they're viewed, she always uses that word, and she thinks that they're viewed differently now, but yeah, I just feel like, I don't know, the other thing that keeps coming, I keep thinking about in the conversation, and I'm, I'm not trying to throw shade, but, you know, Henry Geldzoller, I just remember that was, I watched that documentary, Who Gets to Call It Art?, and, you know, he kind of had free, I mean, he was a socialite, you know, came from a rich family. He had kind of free reign at the Met. You know, there are curators who decide what we, what ends up going up on the wall. And Linda alluded to this and what gets hung. And Henry chose white people, mostly white dudes who painted a specific way. And that's what got hung. And that's what yeah. stayed. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know, Lowry Sims, you know, who the Met hired, the first black curator in the Met's history, did a lot to change things. But, you know, I mean, and Lowry was such an ally for so many people, but uh, she could only do so much. And I just, I remember watching, I, I don't think I ha have a need to ever rewatch that documentary because I'm not a, a Henry Geldzoller fan. Um, I'm just not, I, I, there, there's like, no, he's not, he was, I, in my opinion, he wasn't cute. So there's no reason to, I don't know. There wasn't, there's no reason to watch it again. But I remember just watching it. And I think if I were to watch it again now, I'd be like, wow, like you really did not think about the politics of any of this. Like visibility, none of this, just you were not, this was like, oh, I really love Larry Poons. I love Kenneth Nolan. I love John Chamberlain. Like, you know, it's like, okay, there's three dudes right there making abstract work, two of which are Greenbergian formalists. You know, I mean, I don't know. I was, all, I, it sort of boggles the mind just because I cannot, I can't, I can't put myself in that headspace where I wouldn't be like, what are you doing? You yeah. know? But if you can imagine, multiply that individual times hmm, 2000 um, or more. museums or more across the country <clears throat> and or galleries where, you know, I'm just going to do my thing. And it winds up looking that way, right? I mean, we made a conscious effort uh, to bring on board an as uh, associated curator um, from uh, uh, just, just her, her um, knowledge of the indigenous um, uh, uh, sector of, of this art world was really important for us because we said, oh, by the way, we're not going to have uh, this indigenous 
objects, art objects, artists off in a corner. Mm -hmm. It's going to be part of the American story. Right, no anthropological and, display. And, right, it, 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 totally. And just to make this clear, we want to start sending the message. We had a separate exhibition um, that year with uh, Wendy Red Star. She is a feminist, multi-disciplined artist from the Crow Nation who had a very different way of showing um, what this art is and also saying, and, and you know what? We're not uh, non-existent. There are avant-garde artists that happen to be from the Crow Nation and we're doing this work right now. And this is what it, it looks like. And this is what the, the uh, notion of a, uh, uh, a TP looks like today and why you may drive by it thinking it's just some blankets hanging out. It, 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 it was um, a way for us to really kind of try to start embedding that story into the American story. Thus, you then find those artists. Then now you're exposing um, uh, someone like uh, Wendy Redstar um, uh, to a world, not only of collectors, but just the, um, the public understanding, oh, this is another way for me to look at um, these stories that were only told at one point um, through a very, very, very narrow lens. And I think, that, I think American galleries and, and America, because I actually really believe in this country a lot. Um, and I think American galleries and American museums have a unique opportunity because we are such a diverse place. Wherever you right. go, you know, it's different. You know, every state, you know, it's, I mean, it could be a different country and we're so diverse. And isn't it so much more interesting oh. to go to a museum where you go, wow, we are so interesting. We're so, we all come from different places. We're this color, we're that color, that ethnicity, you know, this, you know, uh, religion or, I mean, we all have different ways of looking at things, which is what art is about. But isn't that the purpose of the, isn't that the American story? And if, if we can tell that in museums, see, this is where right. value comes up again, though, because the auction houses and the market is always the last to catch up. And so I would argue that, um, you know, and I'm going to take a swing at them here. Swan Auction Galleries continues to have this, it's called African American Fine Art is an auction. I find that incredibly racist. Why is there a sale called African American Fine Art? Why isn't it just incorporated into their contemporary into, art sale? Right. It's contemporary exactly. art. Exactly. Stop ghettoizing it. You know, it doesn't make any sense. And people continue to consign things to them um, when they could be, you know, you want to, I don't particularly like working with auction houses, but if you want to expand the conversation, send it to Christie's and Sotheby's, which have a much wider client base. You know, and they might not know what to do with it because most mm -hmm. auction houses don't, but at least it, you're not making it look like it belongs in this little tiny, ca I mean, it's a, it's a ghettoization. Well, you, know? you see, that's, that's part of um, our, uh, as museum uh, directors um, today, that we have to challenge the Sotheby's and the Christie's on where uh, this art goes. And we have that opportunity every time we be a session, a piece of art uh, that either one of the auction houses, uh, well, there, there, are at, there are at least a half a dozen or so, but we have to um, have those conversations, not just in um, challenging them, but also challenging them on who's this team that's making yeah. this decision. Wait yeah. a minute. I'm going to, and, and I've just done that in a couple of cases. It's like, you can't have a team supporting um, the Newark Museum of Art that looks like 1955. Yeah. Right. It cannot happen. And, and that's how we start making, breaking down um, and having these real conversations. And I'm, I mean, in, in one case, uh, the president of this auction house um, was on the phone calling me like almost within hours because I dare to even say the words, your team is not representative of the diverse community, the assets that uh, you would be managing for us. This is what we have to do in order to break that down and not have it, uh, oh, it's the black people over here ghetto, the, 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 the Portuguese over here, another, um, uh, ghetto as how it has been perceived on uh, the. You're just saying it because you're in Newark. 
Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, she's she's running the biggest uh, art museum in New Jersey. Yeah. Yeah. Well. So um, we are uh, running down here, and I think we've had a real love fest, which I think I want to break up a little bit. <laughs> But the one thing I do want to say, I, I said earlier th that uh, I've known Joyce for a long time and admired her work and admired herself as a, as a strong person. Um, I first heard of Garth um, because he represents my then neighbor uh, in the Deeds building in, in Newark. So the Drexlers lived a couple of stories uh, below where I actually still live. So we've had a lot of agreement here, um, but to what extent do the values of artists and museums and galleries, we've said overlap, but conflict? <laughs> that's a that's a good question on on conflict because I, I think what we're I, I know what I'm trying to do at the museum is really have more collaboration. I mean, um, I'm, I'm about to send Linda an email suggesting we have lunch. <laughs> and Joyce. <laughs> <laughs> Because and, we're we are the new guard that is uh, really oh, definitely. Um, trying. I think you to, have I think you have the luxury right now of choosing. It's a big art world, and you can choose who you work with. You know, you don't have to work with people. It's a like it's it's like when you meet people who, um, I don't know. It's like when I when I go to an art fair now and I meet someone who hasn't heard of Howardina Pendel, and I'm, they're like, "Oh, I wasn't aware of this artist." I'm just like, not to not to again sound like a jerk, but like. What are you talking about? You know, not like she's not a house. I mean, not like she's a household name, you know, but it's the same thing. Like when people make statements like that or say, oh, I'm surprised at the price. Oh, I've never heard of this person. It's sort of like, don't say that to me. You know what I mean? Just like just it, you, you can admit that you don't know something. So I think we have the luxury at this point because it's such a diverse art world to of choosing who we work with and so maybe there doesn't have to be as much conflict mm -hmm. because it is a new guard and it's a new okay okay so like maybe different. conflict <laughs> is too strong a word but difference I yes ask. Joyce, Joyce um i i think that um uh, a lot of uh decisions or or changes come about through artists through the artist community through artists talking to each other through artists who are, who we think are doing interesting work that we tell one another about. And, uh, and maybe we should be listened to more. Okay, that is that and, is And a, I wanna say an now, I wanna say now with Facebook and Instagram, artists are always posting other artists work all the time. Yeah. They're good, nice artists are posting other artists' well, work. Yes, there are some who only post their own, but uh, many, many do post other artists' work. They they see a show, they think it's good, they want people to know about it. I think that the you know, and those posts are are good. I mean, they're, they're those posts are are carefully thought through. I mean, people aren't just posting their friends. They they're posting artists are posting other artists who they admire, who they maybe never yet met. And I think that this is this has got to have an impact on the galleries and museums, starting with the artists, starting with the artist conversation. Well, I mean, I have a whole list of artists. I have a whole roster of artists at the gallery that I, you know, didn't know about or didn't know anywhere near as well or have any connection to. Had John Quick to see Smith not put me in touch with them, uh -huh. you know. I mean, or, yeah. or, or made me aware of them. I mean, yeah. the conversations, you know, artists talk to each other. I mean, Howardina and Jean have known each other for a long time. It turns out Rosalind has known Jean for a long time through Joy Harjo, um, which is totally bizarre to me, but not really because Rosalind knows everybody. Um, and um, I mean, it's, yeah, I, th I think that, I think that artists, artists do, you know, I, when I remember when I was first starting out, uh, and I still am, but I remember when I would show, I think I remember our first Ralph Humphrey show, um, which was in 2012. And I had 
people who were Ralph's, you know, friends, gallery mates, Ralph's been gone a long time, come up and say, oh, you should look at this person's work. Or you should look at this person's work, or I can put you in touch with this person. Have you considered this, you know? And it's been extraordinarily helpful, you know? Well, and you would think that museums um, would have um, artists, uh, uh, committees, advisory board, having artists as on their trustee, uh, uh, board of trustees, it just be standard op operating procedure. And it's not. Um, and because there's that quiet, like, oh, well, well, we'll check in with the artist later. We have, we, we have this direction we want to go. And so we are now in the process of um, looking at um, having um, at least three artists join our board of trustees. And uh, b because and, and particularly, um, we know that um, uh, they will be um, uh, in association with our um, uh, acquisitions and collections committee, um, but even other areas. And we we just haven't done this because I think um, uh, sometimes we we feared um, really hearing, and now we really want the artists to be part of the conversation with us as we are moving through making these kinds of um, uh, decisions around um, acquisitions and collections. So this this is something that um, um, I, I know that I'm I'm doing, and um, a number of my colleagues not just an advisory committee, but literally having them on yes. the board of trustees and having a voice. A museum that's uh, done this for a while is MOCA in LA. They have very active. Yeah, MOCA is very artist driven. Well, it's, it's I mean, wasn't it, uh, Joyce, do you remember if it, it was, it's artist founded, right? I mean, wasn't well, it? I, I don't remember. Well, no, I think the uh, Broad family um, helped uh, Eli, uh, uh, helped found it, but they, they are very like, we are driven to hear and listen to the artists and, and see, you know, I think they're like 60 years old or so. And so they, they've leaned into it <laughs> and, and really, so we all want to really follow that kind of um, yeah. model. Okay. So um, in the, the first two of these conversations, there's one or more to go uh, in the fall about big money uh, influencing how we can see art. Um, but I, I talked to artists in the first two, and the question of hair came up. This happens to be one of my interests. Uh, uh, and so I want to ask you all, how much does an artist's hair play a part in how that artist's work gets seen? Hmm. I wish I had more hair. <laughs> um, um, I, how much does an artist's hair? I, I don't, I don't think I've uh, connected it in that way. Um, uh, unless the artist's work is about hair. Uh, there, no, there are no, a number. No, I'm talking, you know, recently we've had uh, on hyperallergic, for instance, uh, uh, articles about what artists wear, artists clothes. Oh, oh. Okay. so take the importance of self-fashioning in clothing into self-fashioning in hair. And I, I think I'm I'm less in, I mean I'm going to be honest, and this is a prejudice of mine, but I think that if you are if you come to an opening and you're wearing paint spattered pants, or you have a you know. Um, like, you know, hey, look at me hairstyle or something like that, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna walk the other way just because okay. I'm sort of like, oh, you wore your art costume. Um, but I don't know, I mean. I don't know, that's a, an expression of their identity. I, I mean, and, and I mean, shouldn't as they someone bring gets... their complete selves to um, uh, their art as well as then to um, wherever they're uh, showing this yeah. art? I mean, we no, I mean, if they're going, I mean, if, I mean, if they're going to, if it's not someone you're working with and they show up to your opening and they're wearing paint spattered pants and have an outlandish hairstyle, I, I have the, the chances are they're going to talk to you about their work. <laughs> okay. All right. Anything you want to add, Joyce? Well, um, a years ago, a friend of mine was going to do an exhibition. I don't think she ever got it together, but years ago um, about our, our hair. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I think it's a, still a show that could happen, you know? Yeah. Well, the wonderful our, art, art of made art from does hair. make art about hair. So um, I'll remember, Garth, when I come to your opening <laughs> to wear a wig. 
<laughs> no, don't wear a wig. Just very, don't. Very, just don't, very. Just don't much. wear. It's like who did? Um, forget. I was talking to someone, and they said like they remembered always being told that if you went to a party, you had to have a thing. So like you would show up and like be the guy that smokes a pipe, and they'd be like, "Oh, oh there's oh, there's, there's the, the guy. guy that, oh, he's the one that smokes a pipe. I right. oh, I remember right. him." Yeah. No. There was a guy who came to all the openings that had a mustache that went like this. Do you remember him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what about the guy with the crazy tie? You know, the guy okay. with the crazy tie. All right. a, it's like a, it's, no, it's, it has an electric so motor. Much. Thank you, Linda Harrison. <laughs> Thank you, George Kozlov. Thank you, Garth Greenan. We have had a very helpful discussion of excellence and aesthetics and value. See you next time. Bye bye.